How's it going everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins and welcome back to another exciting episode of the most rare and valuable coins in Canada. Today we're counting down 10 super rare Canadian pennies that you have a good chance of finding by searching through your change jars or your coin collection and if identified correctly can make you some serious money. Every single one of the coins that we discuss today, although rare, is not impossible to find and in this video we will explore each of these valuable pieces of currency and delve into why they hold such incredible value in Canadian numismatics. Additionally, we will discuss any of their distinguishing and identifying features, their significance among collectors, and also the potential value if you were ever to find a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can follow along with my new content as it is being released. And make sure to stay to the end of the video if you would like to find out which is the most valuable Canadian penny that you can find. And then without further ado, what do you say we get right into it and break down my picks for the 10 most super rare Canadian pennies. Let's get it guys. The Royal Canadian Mint made the decision to switch from the large one cent coin to the smaller penny due to economic considerations and changes in the cost of production. The transition took place in the year 1920 when the Mint introduced a smaller version of the one cent coin. Here's a brief overview of how the process took place and some of the reasons for the switch. Cost factors. The primary reason for transitioning to a smaller penny was cost related. The larger one cent coin, also known as the large cent, was traditionally made of bronze and then copper and had a higher production cost. Metal composition. The large cent, which was introduced in the year 1858, was initially made of pure copper. However, during World War I, the mint began using bronze, which is a copper alloy composed of 95% copper, 4% tin, and 1% zinc. This change was made to conserve copper for the war effort. In the year 1920, the Canadian Mint introduced the smaller version of the one cent coin. The new coin retained the same bronze composition but featured a reduced size and weight. The transition involved a change in design as well. The obverse, also known as the head side of the coin, continued to feature the reigning monarch but the design on the reverse was slightly modified to fit the smaller size. Now some of the reasons for this switch. Cost savings. The smaller penny was more cost effective to produce than the larger one. The reduced amount of metal required for each coin contributed to lower production costs. Economic efficiency. Smaller coins are generally more practical in terms of handling and transportation. They take up less space and are lighter, making them more convenient for daily transactions. Adaptation to economic changes. Economic conditions, including fluctuations in metal prices and the cost of production, influence the design to switch to a smaller coin that could be produced more efficiently. Now there are several factors that can contribute to lower mintages for certain years for Canadian coins which can make them much more rare and potentially valuable amongst collectors. Now here are some of the factors that could contribute to lower mintages for certain years for Canadian coins which could potentially make them more rare and valuable to collectors. Economic factors such as periods of economic downturn or instability could impact the demand for coins. Lower economic activities might result in reduced coin production. Shifts in public demand for specific coin denominations or changes in payment habits could influence the need for certain coin denominations. Fluctuations in the prices and availability of metals used in coin production such as copper and zinc can affect mintages. Higher metal costs might lead to reduced coin production. Advances in minting technology and production processes can influence the efficiency of coin production. If the mint adopted more efficient methods, it might affect the overall mintage. Events such as wars, political changes, or other significant societal events can impact coin production. For example, during wartime, resources might be diverted for war efforts affecting coin production. Technical issues, maintenance, or other challenges at the minting facilities could also lead to lower mintages for specific years. Also, the introduction of new coin designs or modifications to existing designs can sometimes lead to lower initial mintages as people adjust to the change. Collectors might also be interested in the first year for a new design. 
Some coins might also be hoarded or melted down for their metal content, leading to a reduction in the number of coins available for circulation or that are able to be collected. Now the three most sought after dates when it comes to the King George V small cents and the coins that you are here to find out about are the years 1922, 1923, and 1925. Now I'm excluding the 1936 dot from this list because it is a holy grail coin and it usually will come out of a specimen set. It is not saying that there might not be a few of them floating out there in the wilds of circulation or in a collection, but usually if you stumble across a coin like that, it is gonna be a counterfeit. There aren't any notable errors or varieties known for the dates 1922, 1923, and 1925. Instead, their value actually comes from their incredibly low mintages. In the world of numismatics, considering how many billions of Canadian pennies were struck between the years 1858 until their discontinuation in 2012, with mintage figures floating around a million apiece, these are not only incredibly scarce compared to low mintage American coins, but also very rare and hard to find when it comes to collecting Canadian pennies. Now some of the details and specifications for these coins of any of these are off and may indicate that the coin is not a legitimate example. Online auction sites are rife with counterfeit coins, so these are a few that could be very suspect, especially if discovered in good condition in this day and age. If you do find any of these dates, you definitely want to get a second opinion. Now, I have actually ordered some counterfeit examples of some of the most rare Canadian coins of all time to give you guys an example of how bad this problem currently is. So stay tuned for that video. It's going to be released over the next couple weeks. Now, the specs and mintage figures for the 1922, 1923, and 1925 pennies are as followed. First, we will start with the mintage figures for these three coins. The 1922 small cent has a mintage figure of 7,601,627. The 1923 penny has a mintage figure of 1,019,022. The mintage figure for the 1925 is the lowest of the three. It has a mintage figure of 1,622,000. Now the specifications for all three of these small cents are the same and are as followed. They all have a composition of 95% copper, 3% tin, and 1.5% zinc. They have a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters. The edge is plain or smooth. They are in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. The obverse was designed and engraved by Sir Edgar Bertram McKennell and the reverse by Fred Lewis. Now, unlike many of the other coins that I cover on this channel, these coins are actually pretty valuable to find on the low end, especially for pennies. Even if you find them in absolutely terrible beat up condition and they have been put through the meat grinder, you can still get a couple of bucks for these coins. So first we will start with the 1922 small cent. On the low end, it can be worth around $11 for an AG3. Now that is at the absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale. Even though these pennies are a little bit older, I have known some people that have been able to find them. If you're able to get your hands on some wild penny rolls or God forbid, a box of pennies from the bank, then you may just be able to get lucky and score one of these dates. Now the 1922 can be worth around $29.70 for an F12 and around $125 for an AU50. Now, as we start to get into the mint region, the 1922 can be worth around $231 for an MS60, around $1,380 for an MS63, and all the way up to $10,500 for an MS65, which is currently the highest evaluated example. Now, up next is going to be the 1923 Canadian small cent. It can be worth around $15 for an AG3, which is at the absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale. It can be worth around $40 for a VG8 and all the way up to $154 for an AU50 example. As we start to get into the mint range, the 1923 can be worth around $327 for an MS60 and all the way up to $4,000. $530 for an MS64. So it is a bit more rare and valuable than the 1922 and it has a lower mintage figure so that is not surprising. Now last but not least we have the 1925 
which is probably the most rare and viable standard issue King George V small scent. This is the one that everybody looks for. It is a key date for sure with a super low mintage figure just around a million. Some of these were probably destroyed, which makes finding examples nowadays even harder, but I have known coin roll hunters that have discovered 1925s. Now, when it comes to value, it is actually only worth $12.80 for an AG3, so still very valuable for a penny on the low end, but not quite as valuable as the 1923. It can be worth around $31 for a VG8 and all the way up to $107 for an AU50 example. Now, as we start to get into the mint state region, the 1925 is worth around $227 for an MS60, $2,660 for an MS64, and this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $6,900 for an EF40. So when it comes to the values and prices of these pennies, they fluctuate pretty rapidly and they go up and down. It depends on the collector's market, but honestly, depending on which one you want the most, I would wanna have the 1925. It has the lowest mintage figure and currently an MS66 is the highest graded known example. But even though the 1922 isn't worth as much on the low end, it is actually worth the much on the high end, worth around $10,500 for an MS65. So that would definitely be a nice one to find if it was in good condition. The first Canadian scent was produced in the year 1858 and measured 1 inch or 25.4 millimeters in diameter and approximately 4.54 grams in weight. Prior to 1858, the Canadian monetary system relied heavily on British coinage, bank and commercial tokens, known by their French name as sous, also US cash and Spanish milled dollars. These scents were initially established to bring some sort of order to the monetary system in Canada. With the goal of using these coins as measurement tools, the coin parameters were determined and the public's acceptance of these tokens was severely hampered by their small weight when compared to the easily accessible bank and merchant halfpenny tokens of the time. The Dominion government of Canada inherited the coins in 1867 and some of them were even sold at a discount of 20%. It wasn't until 1876 that the need for new cents with the weight increased to 5.67 grams became apparent. The diameter of a large cent from 1858 to 1920 was 23.88 millimeters or 0 0.940 inches, making them much larger than contemporary one cent coins and even much larger than contemporary 25 cent pieces of the time. These enormous large scent coins, which were produced after Confederation on British halfpenny planchettes, were issued and worth about the same value as the halfpenny. After being issued, they were in use in the province of Canada, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Prior to that time, British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland all continued to mint their own pennies until they joined Confederation. Eventually, the size of the penny was shrunk to its current size in the year 1920, making it more comparable to the American penny. Now, before we get into how to identify and value this coin, if you were ever to find one, let's go over pattern or trial coins. Canadian pattern or trial coins are unique and rare coin prototypes created as part of the coin design and production process. They were minted to test new designs, metals, or production techniques before the mass production of regular circulation coins. These coins often feature experimental or alternate designs, inscriptions, or metal compositions. Some of the key features that can identify Canadian pattern or trial coins, they can have unique designs. Pattern coins frequently showcase unique or experimental designs that differ from the final versions of the coins issued for circulations. These designs may include variations in motifs, inscriptions, or even entirely new themes. They can also have a limited mintage. Pattern coins were often struck in very limited quantities, making them scarce and highly sought after by collectors. The low mintage figures adds to their rarity and value. They can be composed of various metals. Some pattern coins were struck in different metals or alloys, testing their durability and also appearance. These may include variations in copper, silver, gold, bronze, and other metals. They may have distinguishing markings. Pattern coins often bear distinguishing markings to indicate their experimental nature. Modern pattern coins can also include the words pattern or trial or test on the coin's surface. Historical significance. These coins provide valuable insights into the coinage development process, the evolution of designs, and also the decision-making of mint authorities. 
They're a window into the history of Canadian coinage. And also, they're collectible rarity. Collectors of Canadian coins value pattern coins for their historical significance and rarity. The value of these coins can vary widely based on factors such as the specific design, metal composition, condition, and also collector demand. Authenticity is also crucial when purchasing pattern coins as counterfeit or replica pieces do exist. Now to differentiate between the regular strike and the pattern 1911 Canadian large cent or penny, you need to flip over and look on the coin's obverse. The pattern or trial piece will include the inscription George 5th D-E-I-G-R-A-R-E-X-E-T-I-N-D-I-M-P. In contrast, the regular strike of the 1911 Canadian penny will not include the G-R-A, which stands for by the grace of God in Latin in the inscription. It may be shocking that such a minor difference can bring such a substantial value and premium to this coin, but if you understood how rare this penny truly is, you might understand why people are willing to pay such buku amounts of money for one of these bad boys. Currently, there are only a few known examples of this coin, and they will receive the SP or specimen designation. Usually that is the designation that pattern or trial pieces will receive from PCGS. At this point, coming across large Canadian pennies or cents to search for errors or variations doesn't happen too often, even for those with some experience in collecting and coin roll hunting. But if you do want the opportunity to search some large pennies for holy grails like this 1911 pattern piece, I would suggest your best chance at this point would probably be to look for bulk lots on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, or even a flea market. Generally, coin shops will charge around a dollar for an average condition large penny, so if you can find a bulk lot where you pay less than a dollar per coin, you are not doing too bad. This 1911 pattern penny was produced at the Royal Mint facility in London, and because the obverse design was changing to accommodate the coronation of King George V, there were several tests conducted and many legendary coins were created, the most noteworthy of which would probably be this coin's big brother, the 1911 silver dollar, which is commonly acknowledged and referred to as the most rare and viable Canadian coin currently in existence. So what do you say we discuss the specifications and potential value if you were ever to stumble across one of these legendary pennies? If any of the specifications are off, it may indicate that the coin is not legitimate or authentic. The 1911 pattern penny is composed of a bronze alloy which is 95% copper, 4% tin, and 1% zinc. It has a weight of 5.6 grams, a diameter of 25.4 millimeters, and is in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, to identify this 1911 pattern piece, all you need to do is flip over to the obverse, and if it has the GRA, then you have one extremely rare Canadian penny that can be worth all the way up to $60,000 for an SP65. If you were ever to find one of these and sent it to PCGS to be graded, it would receive the SP or specimen designation. Currently, the highest graded known example is an SP65, but I'm gonna give you the North Central Coins estimate. If you were able to find and identify one of these 1911 pattern pennies, I believe that it could truly be worth up to $100,000 for an SP67 example. So this coin, even on the lower end, is probably worth around $10,000. And as you start to go up into the MS range, you start to see some crazy money where it tops out at $60,000 for an SP65 example. So between the years of 2000 and 2006, it was quite an experimental time at the Royal Canadian Mint for Canadian pennies. And because of this, six different varieties were actually created for the Canadian 2006 penny. And amongst those, there is a Holy Grail penny that can be worth crazy amounts of money. In the past, I've discussed some of the Holy Grail coins that have been discovered or that you can actually find, but there are a few modern coins that are as rare and valuable as the 2006 P non-magnetic Canadian penny. The thing about this coin is that you actually have a decent chance of finding one of them if you hunt pennies regularly. I have actually heard of Canadian coin roll hunters stumbling upon this rare gem. It is honestly one of the most well-known and looked for pennies in Canada that you actually have a decent chance of finding eventually. In terms of its scarcity, this penny actually reminds me a lot to the 1922 to 1925 George V pennies. 
These pennies, although extremely rare and hard to come by, are not impossible to find and even in low grade examples of both the 2006 P Nod Magnetics and also some of the early 1920s small pennies, they can all be worth minimum of $20 to $30 even at the bottom of their grading tier. So very similar values and scarcity for these Canadian pennies. So stay tuned because I'm definitely going to be making some videos in the future on those early 1920s Canadian small cents. They can be worth just absolutely insane money. But what do you say we discuss the values and specifications of these 2006 Canadian pennies? Because as I mentioned, there are six different varieties and some of them can be worth some okay money. Some of them can be worth pretty much face value and some of them can be worth a whole heck of a lot of money. And I'm also going to talk briefly about an extremely valuable 2005 Canadian penny out of a proof set that you should definitely have on your radar as well. So let's get into the values of these coins. I'm going to start with these 2005s because they're actually a little bit easier. Now, in terms of value, the 2005s are not too rare or too valuable, at least to find the business strikes or circulation examples. But there exists an extremely rare and valuable variety for the 2005 Canadian pennies, and it is actually a proof strike. And that is the 2005 P non-magnetic Canadian proof penny. Now, just to give you guys an idea of the values of the 2005 Canadian pennies, the 2005 regular Canadian proof strike so no P mint mark is worth around $1.95 for a PL64 example and can be worth around $40 for a PL67 the 2005 P from the proof sets the magnetic example is worth around $1.45 for a PL64 and can be worth all the way up to $32.90 for a PL67 and then we have the 2005 P non-magnetic now this thing is a holy grail your chance of finding it in a coin roll hunt is pretty much slim to nil, but never say never. I have seen much crazier things happen. Your best chance of finding one of these 2005 P non-magnetic Canadian proof pennies is to carry a magnet around with you, go to coin shops, flea markets, maybe check Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji and look for 2005 Canadian proof sets with P mint marks. And basically you just gotta throw that magnet onto the penny. And if it doesn't stick to the penny, you might have a holy grail coin that can be worth $1,150 for a PL64 and all the way up to $3,290 for a PL67. This is one of the holy grails of the modern Canadian pennies. There were very few examples struck, so definitely keep your eyes out for 2005 P proof sets. And if you have a magnet with you, maybe just give that penny a little tap. And if it doesn't stick, then you might have a jackpot on your hands. All right, so what do you say we start going through the 2006 pennies? I'm gonna discuss the compositions as well as some of the identifying factors of these pennies so that way you can find the ones that are worth good money because there are two of the 2006 pennies that can be extremely rare and valuable. So the first one that we are gonna discuss is not gonna be one of the rare ones and that is the 2006 with a P mint mark and this is a magnetic example. So to identify this, you wanna flip over to the obverse and look for a little P mint mark under the bust of the queen. It will also have a magnetic steel planchette. Now, in terms of value, it's worth around five cents for an MS-60, so pretty much worth face value at the bottom of the MS scale, maybe slightly more. And this one can be worth $73.70 for an MS-67 example, which is an extremely high grade example. Now, next up, we're actually going to discuss the rarest and most valuable of the 2006 Canadian pennies, and that is the 2006 P non-magnetic so basically to identify this one you want to flip over to the obverse of the coin and look for a little p mint mark under the bust of the queen this coin will have a non-magnetic copper planchette now one of the great things about the rare 2006 pennies that also makes them one of the most searched for pennies here in canada when it comes to coin roll hunting is that they actually have a pretty decent value on the low end now the 2006 p non-magnetic can be worth around $40 for a VF12. So that is pretty much at the bottom of the Sheldon scale. Even if it is absolutely beat up, sat in a parking lot, you're gonna be getting 10 or $20 for this coin. People want them for their collection. And even though they are out there, they are honestly a unicorn and you almost never stumble across them. So as I mentioned, this 2006 P non-magnetic can be worth around $40 for a VF example. It can be worth $132 for an almost uncirculated 50. And then on the high end it can be worth $500 for an MS60 and all the way up to $2,000 
for an MS65. This is a fairly recent penny. I have found coins much older in a high mint state before, so your chances of finding one of these and it actually being in decent condition is not too terrible, honestly. So always keep your eyes out for the 2006 pennies and throw your 2006 P's to the side. Check them with the magnet, and if that magnet does not stick, then you have yourself one extremely rare coin. Now next we'll get into the 2006s with the Royal Canadian Mint logo. Now there is a non-magnetic and a magnetic. Neither of these are particularly rare or valuable. The first we will discuss is the 2006 non-magnetic with the Royal Canadian Mint logo under the bust. To identify it, you wanna flip over to the obverse, look for the Royal Canadian Mint logo under the Queen's bust, and this will have a non-magnetic copper planchette. In terms of value, it's worth around 10 cents for an MS60. It can be worth up to $45 and 30 cents for an MS67, which is an extremely high grade. And then we have the 2006 Royal Canadian Mint logo with a magnetic planchette. To identify this, you wanna flip over to the obverse, look for that Royal Canadian Mint logo under the Queen's bust. It will have a magnetic steel planchette and it can be worth around $1.95 for an MS60 and around $177 for an MS67. So this is definitely the rare of the two varieties. And it may be a good idea to pull a few of these to the side if you're a coin roll hunter. The 2006 Royal Canadian Mint Magnetic seems to be the rare and more valuable of the two. And the last two varieties for the Canadian 2006 pennies that we are going to discuss today are the 2006s without any mint marks. Now, just like the previous four pennies mentioned, there is a magnetic and non-magnetic example for the 2006 Canadian penny with no mint mark. The rare one of the two is the 2006 magnetic. First, we'll discuss the 2006 non-magnetic. Now to identify this, you wanna flip over to the obverse of the coin and there will be no P or no logo of the Royal Canadian Mint mint mark under the Queen's bust. And it will also have a non-magnetic copper planchette. In terms of value, it's worth around five cents for an MS60 example. It can be worth around $47 for an MS67. So very similar prices on the high end for the more common of the 2006 coins. And then we have the second of the Holy Grail 2006 pennies, and that is the 2006 Magnetic No Mint Mark. Now to identify this, you wanna flip over to the obverse of the coin and you are looking for no mint mark under the queen's bust. It will have a magnetic steel planchette. Now it was not made in sets, it was only released in circulation. I have still yet to find either of these two of the rare 2006 pennies, but I shall keep looking and maybe just maybe I will have my day. In terms of value, the 2006 magnetic no mint mark can be worth around $75 for an MS60 and all the way up to $863 for an MS67. This one isn't super valuable on the low end. It can be worth around $10 to $20. If it's in a low grade state, people still really want it for their collections. And because you almost never stumble across these things in the wild, people are always willing to pay a premium to add them to their collection. If you ever did find one of these, I would suggest trying to sell it on maybe eBay or Facebook Marketplace. That's usually where you get the most amount of money for these coins. You can maybe try taking it to your local coin shop, but they're usually not interested in varieties like this. They might pay you like a couple dollars or something like that if you're lucky. In the year 1939, Canada entered World War II. This period saw global tension as Canadian forces, along with those of Great Britain, France, eventually the United States, and other countries fought against the Axis powers in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Although World War II ended in the year 1945, much of the world remained in a state of socio-political turmoil for several years following the war. While operations at the Canadian Mint in Ottawa, Canada's capital city, returned to normal, on the other side of the world, India, which was part of the British Empire, was experiencing social upheaval. A movement for independence, largely led by anti-colonial activist Mahatma Gandhi, achieved its goal on August 15, 1947, when India finally became a fully independent nation. India's independence had implications for the ongoing production of Canadian coinage. Starting in the year 1937, during King George VI's reign, Canadian coins featured an inscription on the obverse side reading Georgius V-I-D-G Rex E-T-I-N-D-I-M-P, which is an abbreviation for the Latin phrase King George VI by the grace of God and Emperor of India. By the year 1948, new dyes reflecting India's independence had not yet been prepared at the Royal Canadian Mint. 
As a result, the production of Canadian coins dated 1947 actually continued into 1948, and these coins would feature a small maple leaf to the bottom right hand side of the 7 in the date. The limited mintage of Canadian coins in the year 1948 can be attributed to several factors, each playing a crucial role in shaping the production of coins during that period. The first was the change in inscription. One of the primary reasons for the reduced coin production in 1948 was the need to change the inscription on Canadian coins. Until that year, the coins bore the inscription ETINDIMP, which signified that the reigning British monarch was also the Emperor of India. But in 1947, India gained its independence from British rule and the British monarch was no longer the Emperor of India. This significant change necessitated the alteration of the coin inscriptions to reflect the new Reality. The process of changing the inscription on coins involved the creation of new master dies and working punches. These tools were essential for minting coins with the updated design and inscription replacing the ETIND IMP. This process was time consuming and intricate, leading to delays in acquiring the necessary dies and punches for the production of the coins with the new design. Due to the complexities involved in producing these new dies and punches, they were not actually available until late into 1948. This delayed the commencement of coin production with the updated designs, and as a result, coin production for that year had a late start, further limiting the number of coins that could be minted with the date 1948. Another noteworthy factor contributing to the limited coin production in 1948 was actually the lack of demand for dollar coins from specific regions in Canada. Cities such as Calgary, Halifax, St. John's, and Regina did not request any dollar coins for that year. This reduced the demand for specific denominations and also played a crucial role in the overall decrease in coin production. The scarcity of Canadian coins minted in the year 1948 can be attributed to the need for a significant change in coin inscriptions following India's independence. The time-consuming process of creating the new dies and working on punches and also the late arrival of these tools reduced demand for certain denominations in specific regions in Canada. These factors combined to make 1948 coins a unique and limited year in Canadian numismatic history with relatively few coins minted compared to other years. Now what makes these 1948 and 1949 pennies so special is not only their limited mintage, but also the fact that there are several different varieties that you can look for. These variations all gravitate around the positioning and size of the denticles in relativity with the text on the coin. The reason for all of these different varieties is they were probably doing some experimenting and trying to see what worked out the best and they wanted to differentiate between the different coins that they were experimenting with and the best way that they could do that is with changing the size and placement of the denticles and wording. So there are several different varieties for both the 19 1948 and 1949, there are three noteworthy varieties for the 1948 and two for the 1949. Now for the 1948, there are small and large denticle varieties and it can affect the value depending on the size of the denticle. For the 1949, the size does not matter as much, only the orientation of the last A in Gratia in relativity to the denticles. So what you wanna do is look at the top of the A and if it points directly to a denticle, then you have yourself one of the rare varieties. Now for the 1948, you want it to point towards a small denticle. That is the rarest of the three different varieties and the A to the large denticle is also fairly valuable as well. Now with the 1949, you also want that last A in Gratia to point directly to one of the denticles. And if you can identify that, it is the rare of the two varieties. So what I'm gonna do is give you guys some of the details and specifications for both of these pennies. And then I'll go through and read off the different values for the different and most valuable varieties that you can look for. So the 1948 and 1949 pennies are composed of 98% copper, 0.5% tin, 1.5% zinc. They have a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters. The obverse was designed and engraved by T.H. Paget, and the reverse was designed and engraved by G.E. Gray. The edge of the coin is smooth, it is non-magnetic, and it has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. So what I'll do is go through and give you guys first the low end values for the different rare varieties for the 1948 and 1949 pennies and then I will give you guys the MS values for these coins as well. They can be super valuable if you do find them and they are in really good shape. And never say never because I've done penny hunts and found some older George the six coins that were almost hitting the MS mark. 
So first we'll start with the 1948. Now the rare variety that you want to look for for the 1948 is the A points directly to the small denticle. Now, if you can identify that, it can be worth even a dollar in a VG, which is pretty much the bottom of the Sheldon scale, not at the absolute bottom, but it is a pretty beat up and worn penny, and you are getting 100 times its face value. That is a pretty extreme premium, and you don't often see premiums like that at the low end for Canadian coins. Now, it can be worth around $30 for an AU50 example, and that is for the 1948 A points to small denticle penny. Now for the 1949, you are looking for the A points to the denticle. This one is actually a little bit more rare and valuable than the 1948. This one can be worth around $6.70 in a VG8. So that is the same grade as the previous one. Not right at the bottom of the Sheldon scale, but pretty darn close. So even if you found one and it is beat up and worn, you can still get a couple dollars for this penny, which is a huge premium for a coin that only has a face value of one cent. It can be worth around $41 for an AU50 example, which is right before you hit the MS mark. So the 1949 A points to Denticle is the rarest of all of these penny varieties that you can look for. Now, when you start to get into the MS range, the 1948 A points to Large Denticle is not quite as valuable as the A points to Small Denticle, but it is still worth some decent money. It can be worth around $6.50 for an MS60, it can be worth around $364 for an MS65, but then you see a massive price jump as currently there is an MS66 graded example that is evaluated at around $1,620. So that tells you that there probably aren't too many high grade examples of this coin out there. So if you ever happen to come across any uncirculated rolls of 1948s or 1949s, don't think about them, buy them. But the rarer of the 1948s that you can look for is the A points to small denticle. If you can identify the last A in Gratia and it is pointing to a small denticle, it can be worth around $70 for an MS60 and all the way up to $882 for an MS65, which is currently the highest graded known example. Now this one is at least twice as valuable as the 1948 A points to large denticle. It's worth around 521 for an MS65, but the previous A points to large denticle penny was worth 1,620 for an MS66. So considering that the highest graded known example of this coin is only an MS65, if you did ever find one of those and it did score any higher, you could easily be talking a 2,000 to $5,000 penny and that is for the 1948 A points to small denticle. Now for the 1949, you are looking for the A points to denticle. This one is actually the most rare and valuable of all of the different pennies that you can look for. It is worth around $70 for an MS60. And even though that is still technically a mint state penny, your chances of being able to score in the low MS region are not impossible when it comes to coins like King George VI. If you do happen to come across a penny box or maybe you go to your local coin shop and you buy a big old bag of scrap pennies. That's what I have actually done in the past and I have found some really amazing stuff. So the 1949 eight points to Denicle can be worth around $71 for an MS60. So that could actually be a huge premium. Even if you sent this to be graded by PCGS, you could still make a profit off of this coin if you did identify a legitimate example. Now the highest graded known example currently for the 1949 eight points to Denicle is an MS66 and it is currently evaluated at $13,900. That is a whole lot of money for a penny that you actually have a decent chance of finding. I have found plenty of 1949s in my coin roll hunt. I have not found any of the super rare varieties, but I will definitely keep my eyes open for this penny and you guys definitely should too. It never hurts to be armed with a little bit of knowledge so you don't accidentally throw a coin back into circulation that could be worth thousands of dollars, if not more. Some of the places that you can get pennies here in Canada are from your bank by asking for a $25 box or some loose rolls. And first of all, hoping that they have any, and secondly, are ready to break procedure in order to give them to you. Unfortunately, every financial institution in Canada is obligated to return any pennies that have been returned to be melted down. Despite this, and also the existence of businesses like Brinks and Garter World, which also operate their own alloy recycling programs, you still may be able to find some pennies out in the wild today. Aside from financial institutions, you could always take a gander on Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji, and you can also check out your local neighborhood coin shop to see if they have any bulk pennies that you can purchase. 
Now that we've given you guys some information on the Canadian penny, what do you say we get into these 1962 penny errors and variations because there are a whole lot that we have to cover here and they can all be worth some really good money if you can identify any of them. So as I mentioned earlier, there are upwards of 10 different errors or variations you can look for when it comes to your Canadian 1962 pennies. The first are the hanging varieties, the most common of which is the single hanging two. If you look above the digit of two on the reverse of the coin, there should be a little line that connects from the top of the two, curving upwards and then horizontally to the left until it touches the maple leaf. This is the result of a die clash and depending on how late into production the dies were used with this air, the more significant it can become. There are also double and even triple hanging twos and the more of these die clashes or lines you can count, the more valuable this variety becomes. Then there's the missing M variety. Usually Canadian pennies will have the initial of MG at the bottom of the portrait of Queen Elizabeth on the obverse. In 1962, whether due to dye deterioration or other technical difficulties, the M in the initial is actually not visible. This variety can also be compounded with the hanging varieties to make it a double error and increase the value substantially. There can also be doubling on the final three digits of the date in 1962, and depending on how many of the digits are doubled, and also the significance of the doubling, it can be quite valuable. The last two notable variations for the 1962 Canadian pennies are also by far the most cool, and those are the guitar and harp variations. As a guitar player my whole life, this is a penny that has been on my radar for a long time, and I still have not been blessed by one of these by the coin gods, but I know other coin roll hunters who have found them, so they are out there. To identify and differentiate between the harp and guitar strings, you have to look underneath the one in the one cent on the top of the reverse of the coin, and if there are lines running vertically from the one to the top of the maple leaf, then you have one of these two very rare coins. The harp lines or strings would appear wider and more spread apart and may not be running all the way down and making contact with the maple leaf. The guitar lines or strings would be more narrow and more pronounced and would run clearly making contact with the maple leaf. The guitar is the rare and more valuable of the two varieties, so that is the one that you want to look for, but finding either one of these would definitely be a nice little treat. Now that we've discussed how to identify some of these varieties, what do you say we get into the values for these pennies? First, we will discuss the 1962 single hanging two. One thing I do want to point out as well is most of these pennies aren't worth too much on the low end. They aren't worth too much more than face value. You might be able to get a couple dollars for them if somebody really wants them or they're trying to fill a hole in their collection. But usually to get the most amount of money from the coins that I'm mentioning, you want them to be in a high grade state. So that means MS60 to MS67. So to identify the single hanging two 1962, you wanna look for the hook that connects from the top of the two to the bottom of the maple leaf. If you can identify that, it can be worth around $9 for an MS60 to an MS62 example. This one can be worth around $300 for an MS66, and it could easily be worth up to $500 to $750 if you were to find one and it scored an MS67, which is extremely hard for Canadian coins. It's very rare that Canadian coins score MS66 or MS67, but never say never. If you're able to find an uncirculated roll of these, there's no reason Reason they may be able to score a high grade like the MS66 or MS67 territory. Then there's the 1962 double hanging two. Now to identify this one, it'll be very similar to the single hanging two, but you wanna look for multiple lines. There should be at least two of them. And in terms of value, it can be worth around $800 for an MS67 example. So it is just slightly more valuable and rare than the single hanging two variety. And then there is the triple hanging two. Now this one is much more rare than the single or double hanging two varieties. It's worth around $38 if you find one in an MS60 or MS62, but you see some massive price jumps with this coin. If you were to find one and it scored anywhere near an MS66 or MS67, it could easily be worth thousands of dollars. If it scored in the MS67 territory, you could easily be talking a $3,000 coin. This is a pretty significant error for it to have three die clashes and get the triple hanging designation. So definitely the hanging twos are good varieties to look for. Then there's the 1962 missing M variety. To identify this one, you wanna look at the bottom of the portrait of Queen Elizabeth. And in most cases, when you check for this air, you're going to see the initials MG. But if you ever check and that M is missing, you have one rare 1962 penny that can be worth $377 
for an MS66 example. And this coin could see a significant price jump as well. It could easily be worth up to $750 if it did score in the MS67 range. Now, even more rare and valuable than the Missing M variety is the 1962 Missing M with a hanging two. Now, this would be known as a double error because it contains two significant errors. So to identify this, it needs to have the die clash giving it the hanging two, and it will also have the Missing M for the initials MG. If you can identify both of these, it can be worth around $205 for an MS65, but it could be worth all the way up to $2,500 for an MS67 if you were to find one and it graded that high. It would seem that they were having a lot of problems with their dies in the year 1962, and your chances of being able to find some of these pennies, even with a double air, are not the worst ever. So keep your eyes out for a missing M and a hanging two on your 1962 pennies. Then there are the 1962s that can contain doubling on the final three digits. Now, if it has a double two, it can be worth around $50 for an MS65. If it has a doubled nine, six and two, so the final three digits all contain machine doubling or die deterioration, then it adds a pretty significant premium. It can be worth around $100 for an MS65. So the price actually jumps to two times the value if it only has doubling on the single digit. And it could easily see some massive price jumps and be worth up to $500 to $1,000 if it's scored in the MS67 range. And then last but not least, we have the two string varieties of the 1962 pennies, and those are the harp and guitar string varieties. Now first is the harp variety. To identify this, you wanna look below the one on one cent on the reverse of the coin, and there should be lines running vertically from the bottom of the one to the top of the maple leaf. The strings on the harp will look wider and less pronounced. This one can be worth around $380 for an MS66 example, but if you were to find one and it scored any higher, it could be worth up to $1,000 for an MS67. Now the 1962 guitar variety is the rare of the two string varieties for the 1962 pennies. It's worth around $100 for an MS64 example, so it's probably worth around $300 for an MS65. Currently, MS64 is the highest graded known example. So if you were able to find one of the 1962 guitar pennies and it graded any higher than MS64, then you would have one very, very rare coin that could easily be worth up to $1,500 for an MS67, to identify this, you wanna look under the one on one cent on the reverse of the coin, and it should have lines running vertically connecting to the top of the maple leaf. The lines should be more narrow and more pronounced on the guitar variety. The Canadian 1964 penny has a very high mintage figure of over 400 million and usually when so many of a certain date is produced there will be some errors or varieties associated with that date simply because they had to produce so many of them. These are some of the factors that can lead to there being errors or varieties on certain high mintage years for coins. Die wear and deterioration. With a high number of coins being minted, dies undergo considerable wear and deterioration. As the dies wear out, they may lose details or develop anomalies that result in errors on the coins struck. Die clashes. In high volume minting, the dies can clash against each other more frequently. Die clashes occur when dies strike each other without a planchette or a blank coin between them, leading to the transfer of details from one die to another, creating distinct errors on subsequent strikes. Variations in die quality. High mintages often mean that multiple sets of dies are employed in the minting process. Variations in die quality, such as differences in engraving depth or details, can contribute to creations of various coin varieties and errors. This increases the probability of anomalies. The higher the mintage, sometimes the greater the probability of anomalies during the minting process. Anomalies can include die chips, die cracks, and other irregularities that can contribute to the uniqueness of each coin. The notable errors for the 1964 Canadian pennies, such as the extra spine, hanging four, missing MG, and the dot, could be attributed to these factors. The high mintage provided more opportunities for variations in die quality, increased instances of die clashes, and also increased the chance of anomalies, resulting in the creation of these distinct errors and varieties for collectors to discover. The large production volume of 1964 pennies adds a layer of intrigue and diversity to the numismatic landscape for that particular year. 
So what I will do is go through each of the different varieties and show you what you will need to look for to identify that particular error. And then once we have shown you each of the different varieties, we will break down the value for each of these coins. So first we're gonna discuss the 1964 extra spine variety. The occurrence of an extra spine on the maple leaf could be attributed to a variety of factors during the die creation process. It might result from a die clash or an anomaly during the engraving or hubbing stages. Die clashes where dies strike each other without a planchette in between can cause unexpected details to be transferred from one die to another, leading to the creation of this extra spine. Now to identify what you want to do is look in between the two top branches of the maple leaf and there should be a small extra spine protruding from the top right hand side. I will show an example of what you need to look for. Next up is going to be the 1964 Hanging 4. Now in the past for the 1962 pennies, I have discussed the Hanging 2 varieties and these are basically the same, but instead you're looking to identify this die clash on the 4 instead of the 2. The Hanging 4 is typically a result of a die clash where the dies used to strike the coin come into contact without a planchette between them. This collision can cause the metal to shift and can create anomalies in the struck coin. The die clashes might have occurred due to the issues in die alignment or due to problems during the striking process leading to this distinctive hanging appearance of the numeral 4 where basically it will look like there is a hook that is going above and running to the left of the top of the last digit 4 in the date 1964. Now there can also be double hanging 4s and even triple hanging 4s so the more of these lines or die clashes that you can identify will add to the number of hanging fours on your 1964 Canadian penny. Now next up is the 1964 Missing MG. Now the absence of the initials MG, which designates the coin's designer, Mary Gillick, may be due to dye deterioration, wear, or damage during the minting process. Dyes undergo significant stress and wear over time, and if not properly maintained or replaced, certain details such as small initials may fail to transfer onto the coins during striking. Usually, if you are looking for the small MG initials, you would look on the very bottom of Queen Elizabeth's bust running along the line of her shoulder, and there should be a small MG initial. Now, in the case of the missing MG variety, it should be absent from the bottom of Queen Elizabeth's bust. And last but not least is the rarest of the 1964 varieties, which is the 1964 dot. The presence of a dot above the digit 9 in the date 1964 could have multiple explanations. It might be the result of a die chip, which a small piece of the die had broken off and leaves an impression on the struck coin. It could also be a cud, where a raised area by a portion of the die becomes worn or damaged. There is also the small possibility that the marking is intentionally put there by the Canadian Mint to distinguish them from other Canadian 1964 pennies, but that is much less likely. The rarity of the dot and its distinct appearance contribute to its desirability among collectors. Now to identify the dot on the 1964 dot penny, what you want to do is look above the digit of 9 in the date and there should be a small dot there. It is pretty pronounced and detailed. Even though allegedly it is not intentional, it does look like from the examples that I have seen like it was almost intentionally put there but it basically is a small die chip or cud located above the digit of nine. Now, before we go over the values of these coins, some of the details and specifications, the overall mintage figure for the Canadian 1964 penny is 484,655,322. It is composed of 98% copper, 0.5% tin, and 1.5% zinc. It is non-magnetic. It has a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters. The edge is plain. It has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British and Australian coins. The obverse was designed and engraved by Mary Gillick and the reverse by GE Kruger Gray. So let's get into the values for these 1964 penny varieties. What I will do is start with the least valuable and work my way up to the most rare and viable of the different varieties. So first we're gonna start off with the extra spine variety. Now, if you can identify the extra spine, it doesn't add too much premium for any of these varieties on the low end. You might be able to get a couple dollars if you sell them online or to someone who is super into errors or varieties. But for the most part, you want these coins to be in pretty good condition 
condition, which is not impossible. I have done a few penny hunts and I have found 1950s pennies that are in mint state. So if you find a roll of 1964s, that is probably your best chance if you bust it open, but you can still find mint state pennies if you are able to get your hands on a box or a couple of rolls from the bank. Now, if you can identify the extra spine, which will have that small extra spine located between the two top branches of the maple leaf on the reverse of the coin, it can be worth around $20 for an MS-64 example. Next up is the 1964 Hanging Four. Once again, to identify the Hanging Four variety, what you wanna do is look for a small die clash, which will look like a line or a hook running along the four in the date 1964. If you can identify that, it can be worth around $20 for an MS-64 and all the way up to $100 for an MS-66, which is about twice as valuable as the regular 1964 penny without any errors or varieties attributed to it. And then we have the missing MG penny. If you can identify the missing MG, which will be missing the initials of Mary Gillick along the bottom of Queen Elizabeth II's bust on the obverse of the coin, it can be worth around $104 for an MS-64 and around $170 for an MS-65. This is one of the more rare of the 1964 varieties and definitely a good one to look for. If you're finding 1964s that are pretty beat up and worn, I wouldn't even bother looking for the missing MG initials because chances are it could have just worn off with circulation. So you want one of these to be on a mint state example. And then last but not least, we have the rarest of the 1964 penny varieties, the 1964 dot. Once again, to identify this, you wanna look above the nine in the date 1964, and you wanna look for a small dot. Now, whether this dot is a die chip cut or it was put there intentionally, it does not matter. If you can find this pronounced dot above the nine on your 1964 penny, it can make it an extremely rare and valuable coin, especially if it is in the mint state range. It can be worth anywhere from a thousand to $3,000 from an MS-65 to MS-66 example. If you were able to identify the 1964 dot and it is worn and beat up, I would still send it in to be attributed by ICCS and it can still probably be worth anywhere from $10 to $50 depending on how bad somebody wants the coin. The 1965 and 1985 pointed five varieties refer to specific varieties of Canadian pennies that were minted in those years. These varieties are sought after by collectors due to their unique design features and also their limited and unknown mintage. The pointed five on these pennies refers to the shape of the numeral five on the coin, which has a sharper, more triangular appearance on the end of the top of the serif rather than the blunt five. Some of the factors that contributed to the creation of this coin include changes in minting technology, artistic preferences, and the need to differentiate coins from previous years. But most likely, the Canadian mint was either just experimenting or they eventually switched their dies and they wanted to differentiate between the switch. Believe it or not, I have actually found some of the large bead pointed five one cent coins in the past. If you guys would like to see that, I definitely suggest you go check out some of my coin roll hunting videos. But another thing you need to look for if you wanna find the rarest of the 1965 coins is also the large bead border. In 1965, there are four variations of pennies overall, all of which gravitate around the pointed and blunt five and also small and large beads. The most rare of all these pennies is the 1965 with the pointed five and the large beads, but the small bead pointed five is the most valuable in a high grade. So identifying that pointed five is the most important thing. To identify it, you need to look at the end of the top serif of the five, for the final digit in the date 1965. If the five looks like it is either slightly angled or comes to a point, then you have the pointed five. If the five is flush or straight and doesn't come to a point, then it is the blunt five. Then you need to flip over to the obverse of the coin and look at the beads that surround the rim of the coin. I will give some examples of what to look for in terms of the large beads, but the best way that I can say to identify your 1965 large bead pennies is actually to hold on to all your 1965 pennies, look at them all under a microscope or zoom in very close with your phone and compare the bead sizes. As soon as you find one that you know for sure has the large beads, keep that one for reference. And then we also have the 1985 penny. Although this coin was made 20 years later, it actually has the same two variations of the blunt and pointed five for its date. 
The pointed 5 1985 penny is very rare and it is actually worth more in a low grade state or a beat up condition if you find one of them. But the blunt 5 1985 can actually be worth some really good money if it gets a high grade or it scores in a mint state. To this day, I still have not found one of these 1985 pennies in any condition that would make it worth getting graded or writing home about, but it's definitely a good one to have on your radar. But now that we've given you an idea of what to look for, what do you say we break down the values for the more rare of all these penny varieties, starting with the small beads pointed five. Now on the low end, the 1965 small beads pointed five is not worth too much at all. It's pretty much worth face value if it is at the low end, but this bad boy can be worth all the way up to 1,800. So you see some massive price jumps from that penny. It goes from $285 to $1,810. So I'm guessing that there isn't too many of these that survived in a high mid state. So it is definitely one to keep your eye out for if you find any 1965 pennies in good shape. And then we also have the large bead pointed five. Now on the low end, this one can be worth around $3.40, even at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale. If it is worn, beat up, and been put through the meat grinder, it is definitely a good one to find. And it can be worth around $13.50 for an AU50. Now in terms of the high end for the large bead pointed 5 1965, it's worth around $21 for an MS60. And this one can be worth all the way up to $1,010. And this is another coin that sees some massive price jumps. So it means very few of these score in the high range and I have actually found 1965s of all varieties in good shape so this is definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for. And then we have the 1985 penny. So you are looking for the pointed five if you wanna make any money on the low end. It isn't worth too much at the bottom of the Sheldon scale, only worth around a dollar if it is all beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder. It can be worth around $5 for an AU50 and the pointed five can be worth up to $267. And then last but not least, we have the 1985 Blunt 5 Penny. Now this one isn't very valuable at all on the low end. At the bottom of the Sheldon scale, it's not worth much more than face value. But as you start to get into the high range of the Sheldon scale and it starts to get into the mid state range, you start to see some massive price jumps. But it can be worth all the way up to $1,570. Now the price jump there goes from $182 to $1,000. $1,570. So if you ever submit one of these things, you got to pray and hope to the coin gods that you maybe get an MS65 or you never even know, maybe an MS66, and then this thing could be worth some great money. So there are a whole lot of varieties to look for, but usually you want to look for the pointed five varieties or you want them to be in very good shape if you want to make the most money out of these pennies. Now, before we get into the 1978 and 1979 pennies, I just briefly want to go over machine doubling with you guys so you have a pretty good idea of how to identify the errors on these coins. Now, machine doubling occurs when a coin is struck by the coin press more than once in quick succession or there is a slight shift or bounce in the coin press during the striking process. It can also occur due to deterioration in the die and some of the characteristics of machine doubling are caused by a misalignment of the coin die with the planchette, a minor shift or vibration of the coin press during the striking, or a loose or slightly damaged or deteriorated die. Now the visual characteristics of machine doubling. Machine doubling results in a few key visual characteristics. Parallel or shelf-like doubling. The doubling lines tend to be parallel to the original design, creating a shelf-like effect. Genuine doubled dies usually show doubling in various directions. And a lack of spread. Unlike true doubled dies, machine doubling does not exhibit the spread or separation between doubled elements. Instead, the doubled features appear squeezed together. Now, machine doubling does not always enhance the value of a coin. In fact, sometimes it can actually make its desirability a little bit less among collectors. Collectors usually seek coins with strong and clear design elements and machine doubling actually detracts from the coin's visual appearance, but it is still an error or variety that can be attributed to coins and certain dates are well known for having machine doubling like the 1980 Canadian nickel and the pennies that we are discussing today. Now when it comes to the Canadian 1978 and 1979 pennies, you are looking to identify machine doubling on the date. There can be several different degrees of doubling and they are differentiated by the amount of digits in the date that contain this machine doubling. 
So depending on how many of the digits are affected, the value generally increases and they are evaluated from right to left. So the doubling can start on the final number in the date and happen only on that number or it can work its way digit by digit to the left and can affect each or all of the different numbers in the date. Depending on how many of these numbers have the doubling, the value typically increases, but the severity of the doubling can also increase its potential value. Let's say you have an example of this coin where the final two digits are attributed with doubling, but it is much more significant and severe than another example with the entire date attributed. It might actually be more desirable to collectors due to the severity of this error. Some of the details and specifications for the 1978 and 1979 Canadian pennies. They're composed of 98% copper, 0.5% tin, and 1.5% zinc. They have a weight of 3.24 grams, a diameter of 19.05 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.55 millimeters. The coins were designed and engraved by Arnold Mockin for the obverse and GE Kruger Gray for the reverse. The edge is smooth, they are non-magnetic, and the die axis is in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now, when it comes to estimating how much these coins can be worth, they are not super valuable on the low end. You might be able to get a premium for them, especially because they are Canadian pennies. I usually say when it comes to coins, it's not how much it is worth, it's how much you can get somebody to pay for. It. That doesn't mean that you should rip people off, but a lot of the time people are willing to overpay for things because they simply want to add it to their collection. Not me, not myself. I have certain things that I go for and like to collect, but everybody has their own preferences. So what I'm going to do is go through and give you guys the values for each of the different attributions of doubling that you can get on these coins. So the 1978, if it has just a doubled eight on it, is worth around $10 for an MS64, but it can be worth all the way up to around $70 for an MS66 example which isn't too much more than the regular 1978. Now as you start to increase in severity of the machine doubling if it has the final two digits doubled so the seven and the eight you're seeing about a 10 to 15 dollar price jump it can be worth around 20 dollars for an ms64 and all the way up to 85 dollars for an ms66 example. Now it doesn't get much more valuable if you only identify the three final digits in the date so if the nine seven and eight all have doubling, it could be worth around $25 for an MS64 and 87 for an MS66. So that is a $2 price jump. But the most valuable of all of the varieties that you can look for is with the entire date containing the machine doubling. So all of the digits in the date, one, nine, seven, and eight will have machine doubling. It can be worth around $30 for an MS64 and 118 for an MS66. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I'm probably never gonna find any of these super rare air coins, but I can tell you that these are much more common than you would think. I have found quite a few 1978 and 1979 pennies with machine doubling, some with the entire date, some with single digits, some that are super severe, and some not so much. And a lot of the time when I come across Canadian pennies, they are in pretty decent shape, especially the ones from the 70s and 80s, because they didn't see too much circulation before they were pulled out in the year 2012. So now let's get into the 1979 double variety pennies. First is the single double nine. So that is the final digit in the date 1979. We'll have machine doubling. It can be worth around $10.90 for an MS64 and all the way up to $453, which is actually the exact same value as the regular 1979. So there is no premium if you only identify doubling in a single digit. And the value pretty much stays the same, honestly, as you go up. If you can identify doubling for the final three digits, you do see a slight price jump. It can be worth around $10 for an MS63 and all the way up to $60 for an MS66. So maybe a dollar more than the regular one. But the variety that you do want to look for is all four of the digits containing doubling and you will get a pretty decent premium for this coin. It can be worth around $15 for an MS64 and the highest graded known example currently is an MS66 which is evaluated at $131. If you were to find one and it scored an MS67 you could easily be talking a thousand dollar penny because the regular 1979 without doubling is around $500. And if you identify machine doubling on the entire date, that coin is worth about twice as much as the regular 1979. In the vast realm of Canadian numismatics, the allure of air coins and minting oddities adds an extra layer of fascination for collectors. 
These anomalies, often the result of unique circumstances during the minting process, can yield coins with striking and perplexing characteristics. While some may argue that certain errors are deliberately created at the mint, the mystery and intrigue surrounding some of these coins remains undeniably captivating. These coins deviate from the standard production procedures, resulting in striking variations that set them apart from their regular counterparts. From misaligned dies to off-center strikes, each air coin tells a tale of its own, reflecting the intricate and occasionally unpredictable nature of coin production. Among the most intriguing specimens are those that exhibit oddities in their composition or design. These coins may feature double strikes where the coin design appears duplicated or planchette errors, which are characterized by irregularities in the metal composition or the thickness of the planchette. Such anomalies not only add to the aesthetic appeal of the coin, but also serve as tangible reminders of the intricacies involved in minting. While encountering these air coins in everyday circulation is exceptionally rare, their discovery sparks excitement and wonder. Each coin represents a unique glimpse into the inner workings of the minting process and also the craftsmanship and ingenuity required to produce currency. Considered to be prized possessions in any collection, Canadian air coins and minting oddities stand as testaments to the rich tapestry of numismatic history. Now, the 1978 double reverse die cap penny air coin represents a remarkable and exceptionally rare find in the world of numismatics. One recognized example of this coin, a PCGS certified MS64 red and brown specimen, stands out not only for its pristine condition, but also for its unique air type. While similar double reverse copper scents exist, with approximately five known and certified, including a notable 1980 PCGS MS64 red variant that recently fetched an impressive $12,500. This particular coin distinguishes itself as the sole known example with a die cap air. Despite being several decades old, the discovery of this extraordinary coin only recently occurred when it was officially certified by PCGS. Remarkably, it is the sole certified instance of a two-headed or two-tailed coin that also exhibits a die cap air, making it an exceedingly rare and coveted addition to anyone who enjoys Canadian air coins collection. The probability of such a combination arising is extraordinarily low, further emphasizing the exceptional nature of this numismatic treasure. The allure of genuine two-headed coins is undeniable, with their scarcity adding to their mystique and desirability among collectors. It's essential to note that these authentic pieces are often mistaken for magician's coins, which are novelty items lacking any significant numismatic value. As experienced collectors continue to seek out rare and exceptional coins to enrich their collections, the discovery of a coin such as this serves as a thrilling reminder of the endless possibilities within the realm of numismatics. With its unique combination of air types and also its impeccable certification, this coin not only represents a tangible piece of history, but also a captivating glimpse into the coin minting process. The most notable sign of a die cap air is that the coin will appear to be raised on one or both sides, almost like a miniature cup or cap. This is because the coin gets stuck in the coin press and continues to be struck multiple times without being ejected properly. Because the coin remains stuck in the press, the design on one or both sides may become distorted or elongated. You might notice that the details look stretched or flattened compared to a regular coin. Another telltale sign of a die cap error is the absence of the raised rims that are typically found on the edge of a coin. Instead, the edges may appear smooth or irregular due to the repeated strikes in the press. If you do suspect that you have a die cap error, it's helpful to compare it to other known examples or images online. This can help you to confirm whether the coin exhibits the characteristics typical of a die cap error. If you are still unsure, consider reaching out to an experienced coin collector or professionals who specialize in these air coins. If you guys haven't, I definitely suggest that you go onto Facebook and check out my group Canadian Coin Roll Hunters. If you guys find any oddities or Canadian numismatic treasures, you can just post it on there and you can get some second opinions on whether the coin is legitimate or not. Die cap errors are considered quite rare and finding one with such distinct characteristics as a double reverse die cap adds to its scarcity with only a handful known to exist. Collectors are willing to pay a massive premium for the opportunity to add such a unique piece to their collection. 
The combination of being a two-headed or two-tailed coin along with being a die cap error makes this particular coin exceptionally rare. It's a one-of-a-kind numismatic oddity that attracts collectors who appreciate the novelty and intrigue of such pieces. Air coins have always held a special fascination for collectors due to the unexpected and often visually striking nature of the coins. Collectors are often willing to pay extremely high prices to acquire these pieces, especially if they're well documented and authenticated by reputable grading services such as PCGS or ICCS here in Canada. As demonstrated by the recent sale of a similar 1980 PCGS MS64 Red example, for $12,500, Coins with similar air types can command significant prices at auctions and private sales. The rarity and demand for these coins drives up their market value, making them valuable assets and investments in the numismatic market. And I can personally attest that experienced collectors are willing to pay some pretty good money for these air coins. One of the most profitable coins that I ever found in one of my coin roll hunts was actually a Grease Air Quarter from the year 2002, and I sold it for somewhere around $50 to $75, and I think it actually had a value of somewhere around $75 to $100, but it was still a really good profit for me. I only paid $0.25 cents for the coin. So air coins can be some of the most valuable and profitable finds that you can get in your coin roll hunts, or if you are searching through your pocket change, you just want to make sure that the coin is legitimate and that it is not post mint damage, which in a lot of cases it probably is. When most people post pictures of coins in the groups and on Facebook online, 98% of the time I would say that it is post mint damage, but it is always good to get a second opinion because you never know when you might have a holy grail or unicorn on your hands. If you're a coin collector looking for something truly unique, the Canadian 1936 dot specimen set is sure to pique your interest. This rare set of coins has a fascinating story behind it, and its rarity and value make it a highly sought after item in the numismatic world. In this video, we'll delve into the history and significance of the 1936 dot coins and explore their place in Canadian coinage and the mystery behind the dot on the coins. So first off, what is a specimen set? A specimen set is a special set of coins produced by the Royal Canadian Mint, usually for presentation purposes. These sets typically feature coins struck with different finishes or in different metal compositions than the regular coinage. They are often made in limited quantities, especially before the year 1970. A lot of the time with the pre-1970 Canadian specimen sets, they had extremely limited mintages. We're talking only 10,000 to maybe 100,000 sets being produced or even less and some of the sets were not actually made for the public. They were only presented to dignitaries and employees of the Mint. So any specimen sets from Canada before the year 1970 can be extremely rare and valuable. So a quick overview of the 1936 dot specimen set. The 1936 dot specimen set is a collection of pieces that were never intended for circulation. This set included three Holy Grail coins, the dot penny, the dot dime, and dot quarter. What makes this set unique is the presence of a small dot. While similar dots had been used in previous years as a means of identifying the dies used to strike the coins, the 1936 dots were used to mark a new set of dies created specifically for specimen coins. The importance of the 1936 dot specimen set in Canadian numismatics. The 1936 dot specimen set is significant for a number of reasons. Firstly, it represents an important period in Canadian coinage history when the Royal Canadian Mint was transitioning from producing coins with a high silver content to those made of nickel. Secondly, the rarity of this set. With only a few of each different denomination known to exist, it makes it one of the most sought after items for coin collectors. Canadian coinage has a very long and storied history dating back to the late 17th century. Over the years, Canadian coins have undergone numerous design changes and were minted using various metals, including gold, silver, and nickel. In the 1920s, the Royal Canadian Mint began transitioning from producing coins with a high silver content to those made of nickel. This decision was made due to the rising cost of silver and the need to reduce production costs. The shift to nickel coins was not without its challenges, as the Mint had to make significant changes to their equipment and processes. Precursors to the 1936 dot specimen set Prior to the release of the 1936 dot specimen set, the Royal Canadian Mint had experimented with a number of different designs and finishes for their specimen coins. 
Some early dates of Canadian specimen coins can feature different finishes. Some notable are the matte and mirror-like finishes. Also, eventually some of the later dates receiving high and low relief designations for the strike quality. So let's get into the mystery of the dot coins. What exactly are they and why were they made? The dot coins were created as part of a new set of dies that were used to strike specimen coins. The dots were used to differentiate the new dies from the ones previously used to strike circulation coins, despite their intended use. So how many of these holy grail coins are currently accounted for and where are they now? Some of the historical sales. In January 3, 2010, from the Bellsberg Collection, a 1936.1 cent coin certified PCGS SP66 Red sold for $410,000 Canadian at a heritage auction. It is among the only three known 1936.1 cent coins. The one with the highest grade, this same coin, sold nine years later in 2019, downgraded to PCGS SP65 during the Cook Collection sale for a similar amount of $415,000 Canadian. On January 12, 2004, during the Pittman Collection sale at the same auction house, another one cent 1936 dot coin certified PCGS MS63 Red was sold for approximately $265,000 Canadian. On April 18, 2013, the same coin was sold again at auction for around $250,000 Canadian. The 1936 dot 10 cent coin there are only four known examples of the 10 cent 1936 dot coin and two are owned by the Bank of Canada. Some of the historical sales, it sold in October 1997 for $182,160 Canadian, one sold on September 14, 2006 for $130,000 Canadian for PCGS SP63 and this is part of the X Pittman and Bellsberg collection. One sold on January 3, 2010 for $196,500 Canadian graded PCGS SP68, which is an extremely high designation, and this is X Maurice Lafortune and Pittman collection. And then another one sold on August 15th, 2019 for 87,800 Canadian dollars, graded SP63, which is X Pittman, Bellsburg, and Cook collection. There are only five specimen 25 cent 1936 dot coins known to exist, and two are owned by the Bank of Canada. Some of the notable historical sales for the 1936.25 cent specimen coin. On January 3rd in 2010, one of these sold for $83,500 for a PCGS SP68 example. Some theories behind the reason for the dot coins. The reason for the creation of the dot coins remains a mystery. Some theories suggest that they were produced as test pieces for a new set of dies, while others speculate that they were created to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of King George V. Whatever the reason, the scarcity of the dot coins has only added to their allure. These dot coins are a unique item in Canadian numismatics. With their distinctive markings and rarity, they represent a pivotal moment in Canadian coinage history and are highly sought after by collectors around the world. Factors that contribute to the rarity and value. The rarity and value of the 1936 dot specimen set are due to a number of factors. Firstly, only three sets are known to exist, making them one of the rarest items in Canadian numismatics. Secondly, the set includes coins with a unique and highly sought after design. Finally, the historical significance of the coins adds to their value. So what does make these 1936 dot specimen coins so valuable? The reason the set is so valuable is because of its rarity, historical significance, and the demand from collectors and investors. With only three sets known to exist, each set is considered a numismatic treasure and can fetch millions of dollars at auction. Even empty storage cases for this set and other early Canadian specimen coins can sometimes be just as rare and valuable as the coins they originally came with. Generally, most modern empty Canadian specimen cases are worthless, but any before the year 1970 can hold some numismatic and collector value. The price for these empty boxes tends to be anywhere from a few hundred to several thousands of dollars for what is essentially an empty wooden box or case, so keeping your eye out for these gems may make you some good money one day, or you may be able to add a nice little piece of Canadian numismatic history to your collection. So the current market value of the 1936 dot specimen coins. Most would consider these coins to be some of the most valuable items in the Canadian numismatic world. And with only three sets known to exist, it's likely that the value of the set will continue to rise in the future. 
To find one of these sets complete could easily make you a millionaire. The complete set has a book appraisal value of $675,000, but with the right buyer, it could easily be worth far more than that. Comparison of the 1936 dot specimen set to other rare Canadian coins. When it comes to rare Canadian coins, the 1936 dot specimen set is in a league of its own. While there are other coins that are considered rare and valuable, such as the 1921.50 cent, the 1921.5 cent, none come close to the rarity of the 1936 dot specimen set. The discovery and uncovering of these coins. The 1936 dot specimen set is an intriguing collection of coins that has captivated the attention of collectors for decades. The set was discovered in the late 1950s when a handful of numismatists found an unusual variation in the 1936 Canadian coins. The full set included a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, and half dollar. Some of these denominations featured a tiny raised dot located below the date on the reverse side of the coin. The dots were a mystery and collectors were intrigued. They soon discovered that the coins were produced as a test set by the Royal Canadian Mint and were never intended for circulation. The dots were placed on coins to distinguish them from regular coins and prevent employees from stealing them. The 1936 dot specimen set has been the subject of several high-profile sales in recent years. In 2010, a collector purchased the set for a record-breaking $402,500 Canadian, making it the most expensive coin set ever sold at the time. In 2013, the set was resold for an even higher price of $550,000 Canadian, cementing its status as one of the most valuable coin sets in Canadian history. The set's impact on modern collectors and investors. The 1936 dot specimen coins have had a significant impact on modern collectors and investors. The set's rarity and unique design make it a highly valuable investment, and collectors are willing to pay top dollar for a chance to own it. The set's popularity has also inspired interest in other rare Canadian coins, and the demand for these coins continues to grow. There are other rare Canadian coins, such as the 1911 Canadian silver dollar, which is actually worth upwards of a million dollars or even more, and the previously mentioned 1921 50 cent and 5 cent denomination, but they are comparable in rarity and value to the 1936 dot coins, however, the 1936 dot specimen set remains one of the most sought after Canadian numismatic treasures in the world. So my final thoughts and conclusion, the 1936 dot specimen coins are a testament to the Royal Canadian Mint's history and innovation and excellence. The set's rarity and unique design make it a captivating piece for collectors and investors alike. Its place in Canadian numismatic history is secure and its legacy will continue to inspire interest and excitement for years to come. Whether you're a seasoned collector or a newcomer to the world of coin collecting, the 1936 dot specimen set is a fascinating piece of valuable Canadian history. In conclusion, this set stands as a testament to the artistry, innovation, and historical significance of Canadian coinage. Its rarity and value make it a prized possession among collectors and investors alike. While its legacy in Canadian numismatic history remains unparalleled, as we continue to uncover the mysteries and stories behind this iconic set, we can only imagine what other treasures may be still awaiting to be discovered in the world of numismatics.